Hi, I'm Toto Oliveira from the University of Utah, and uh, I've been discussing uh, cone snail venoms. So, so far I've been talking about uh, the biology of the cone snails and how they use their venoms and how we can apply individual uh, components of these venoms uh, for biomedical science. But uh, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is to try to take a more uh, prospective view. Uh, what are we going to use these peptides for in the near future? And uh, how are they going to be applied to neuroscience? And so instead of talking about individual peptides, uh, I'd like to talk about an approach. And uh, in order to talk about that approach, uh, I'm first going to focus on one general problem in neuroscience. So what I'd like to do is uh, just to remind you that these venoms are organized uh, in that groups of venoms act together. We call those cabals. And uh, the groups of venoms act on uh, functionally linked ion channels and receptors uh, to affect a dramatic physiological endpoint. But the key thing is that each venom peptide has its own specific molecular target. Uh, and so these general principles that we've learned uh, from cone snail biology are, in a sense, the inspiration uh, for the new approach that we're taking. So the idea is we're not going to use each peptide as a single tool, uh, but try to use them in concert uh, to address questions in neuroscience. So to just give you the kind of issues that we would like to begin to address, uh, let me first uh, uh, talk about one cabal, uh, the lightning strike cabal. And so uh, I've discussed how a combination of kappa and delta uh, conus peptides are used to instantly immobilize a fish. So this is the mixture of toxins uh, that uh, allow a fish hunting cone snail to capture fish by causing essentially uh, gross hyperactivation of the nervous system. But in fact, there are many other biological situations where this combination is used. Uh, scorpions use it to capture their prey as well, as do spiders. Uh, and other types of snails, like uh, the uh, snail hunting cones, also use it. So let me just show you uh, a snail hunting cone. Uh, this is the cloth of gold cone. And when it uh, injects its venom, which it's about to do here, what you're going to see is a dramatic change in the behavior of the snail uh, once the venom has been injected. And so what you're going to see is uh, the snail now is hyperactive. There's no question. Uh, it's unable to move in a coordinated way. Uh, and all you have is this uh, snail going back and forth. So why does the uh, cone snail do this? Uh, why, why does it want to do this to, uh, to its prey? And uh, the reason is that, in fact, uh, the cone snail has a problem. If you're going to hunt a snail and you uh, want to inject your venom into that uh, snail, uh, all snails, the moment you touch them at all, uh, what they do is they go deep inside their shell. And uh, that would be a problem if uh, that's your prey, because uh, the cone snail has no way to break the shell. Uh, and so it has to cause uh, the capture of that snail with the animal outside its shell. And so by hyperactivating uh, the, the prey, uh, you get this motion back and forth. The animal is unable uh, to retreat into its shell, and therefore that makes it easier for the predator to eat it. So you can see that this is a different context for using the lightning strike cabal, but it's the same uh, configuration that's used. You keep sodium channels open. Uh, you block potassium channels. But the question in this case is, which sodium channel is being targeted and which potassium channel? And in general, there are relatively few types of sodium channels. In mammals, there are nine. But the real problem is potassium channels. There is a vast complexity, which is almost completely undefined. So what do I mean by that? So potassium channels are made uh, from 70 different genes, which are grouped into subfamilies. 
And the problem is that the functional potassium channel is a tetramer. And you can assemble different genes to form tetramers. So if we take one example, one subfamily of potassium channels called the, the Shaker subfamily, uh, we have uh, eight different genes, KB 1.1 to 1.8. And what happens is that you can, at least in vitro, combine these in any way you want. In other words, you can form a tetramer from any combination of these eight different genes. And so what that means is, even if you look at how many possibilities there are with two of the genes, uh, you get a whole mixture with two homomers and many heteromers. Uh, and if you focus in on one of these, and now you replace uh, one of the KB1.2 subunits uh, with one of the others in the Shaker subfamily, uh, then, of course, you vastly increase the complexity. Uh, so here, just some of the isoforms that you can form uh, from these uh, few genes in the Shaker subfamily. Uh, and so the problem, again, is if you want to study this by genetics, you do uh, gene knockout. And if you knock out KB1.2, well, you're knocking out every single potential isoform uh, that we see here. And so you can't really get uh, very clear answers using, using molecular genetics alone. And so one does require uh, that there be pharmacology. And so you need a set of complementary pharmacological tools. And what I'll try to uh, show you is that uh, conus venoms are a great source for those complementary tools that are needed. So the kinds of questions that we would like to address is which of these different uh, potential heteromeric K-channel subtypes, which of them actually exist? We don't even know that. Uh, maybe some of them are never formed. And then of those that do exist, uh, where is uh, that subtype found? And more importantly, what's its physiological role? And again, we don't know how to approach these questions. And so our general approach uh, to be able to address this is, first of all, to use native neurons and to tr try to apply conus venom peptides that we know are targeted to potassium channels. And so let me show you how that works. So we take a region of the nervous system, uh, and we've looked at about five different regions now. And most of the data I'm going to show you uh, is going to be experiments that are done uh, primarily by Russ Teichert and coworkers on the dorsal root ganglion. So the dorsal root ganglion is this ganglion right outside uh, the spinal column. And all of the primary sensory neurons uh, go through uh, the axons of the cells that are present in this ganglion. And it's thought from sensory physiology that there are between 25 to 30 different types of neurons that are present uh, in the dorsal root ganglion. So there's presumably one neuronal subclass, when you touch something cold, that says it's cold. If you touch something hot, there's a different neuron that signals that. Uh, if you touch something very hot, there's a neuron that says it's so hot it's painful. Uh, if you feel itchy, there's a different neuron that signals that. If you have a light touch, there's a different neuron that signals that. If you pinch uh, the skin so that it's painful, then there's a different neuron that signals that. So all of these sensory modalities are presumably transmitted by one of these neurons in the dorsal root ganglion. So how do we use this ganglion? What we do is we take the ganglion uh, and dissociate all of the neurons. Uh, and the neuron looks like this with a cell body in the ganglion. But uh, one axon sticks out into the periphery. The other uh, part of the axon sticks uh, into the CNS. So it transmits the information from the periphery to the CNS. And so we dissociate those cells. Uh, that's what a culture looks like. Uh, we typically have a well with 100 to 200 uh, different uh, neurons uh, from the dorsal root ganglion. And then we load the cells with a calcium-sensitive dye. And once the cells are loaded, uh, then we do experiments in which we monitor uh, the response to two wavelengths of light. And that allows us to measure how much calcium there is in the cytosol of every neuron. Now, the power of this approach is we're looking at 100 to 200 cells at a time. 
and we can monitor every single cell in that particular well. We can follow uh, what's happening to the intracellular calcium levels in that cell. Uh, and so what the experiment looks like uh, is shown here. So uh, what you see is a field loaded with FURA2, uh, and on the right is an antibody-treated uh, a uh, bunch of cells after the experiment. But the lower panels are uh, false colored uh, to reflect uh, how much calcium there is. So uh, in blue, that means you have a basal level of calcium uh, inside the cell. Uh, in red, uh, what you see in the middle panel here is cells that have been treated with menthol. And what you can see is that a few cells respond, respond and suddenly raise their calcium level. Uh, but now, if we de depolarize all of the cells by adding potassium chloride, uh, as you can see, almost all of the cells uh, raise their calcium levels. Uh, so we can look at that in another way, at the level of individual cells. Uh, and so uh, in this experiment, uh, what we're doing is we're treating the whole well, so all 200 cells, uh, with a whole bunch of different pharmacological agents. Uh, First, acetylcholine, and then ATP, and then histamine, and then menthol. Uh, and so, if we monitor the cells at this point, uh, then you can see that everybody's at uh, basal levels, uh, and so all the cells are blue. But now, if we monitor the cells uh, at this point, uh, you can see that uh, most of the cells are at basal level, but a few cells do respond to menthol. Uh, so at this point, we're adding menthol. And so you can see uh, in the uh, actually whole field, only, of the few, only a few of the cells are responding. But when we add potassium chloride, as shown at the very, very end, uh, almost all the cells uh, that are neurons respond. Uh, but uh, uh, so we're recording right at the point where we're adding potassium chloride. So this tells you which cells are responding and which not. And as you can see, we've uh, monitored six different cells out of the 100 or 200 present. And you can see that the cells are responding dif differently from each other. Uh, different cells have different responses. Uh, and so presumably, the cells that respond to menthol, because menthol activates the cold thermosensor uh, in these primary sensory neurons, those are the cold-sensitive cells. While the cells that respond to histamine it's known that when you feel itchy, uh, histamine is one of the uh, components that causes you to feel itchy. And so presumably, that group of cells are the itch-sensitive cells. So we can begin, because of sensory physiology, uh, to separate different types of cells and to connect the properties of those cells uh, to their physiological function. So the other way we use this particular platform is we keep on adding potassium chloride every five to seven minutes or so. Uh, and that's what's shown uh, in the traces shown here. And then we pre-incubate uh, with a compound shown on the bar. Uh, and if that compound is pharmacologically active, and especially if it acts on uh, ion channels that are voltage sensitive, so voltage-sensitive sodium channels, calcium channels, or potassium channels, then we will affect the size of the response. And so shown is the response to tetrodotoxin, which inhibits sodium channels. And so when sodium channels are inhibited, uh, there's less calcium that comes into the cell. Uh, however, if we treat with TEA, which inhibits potassium channels, uh, then what happens is potassium channels are inhibited, and therefore potassium channels don't, uh, don't terminate the entry of calcium, and you get more calcium in. And so you see that type of response as well. So these are the kinds of effects that you see uh, in some of the cells. And in essence, by looking at 200 cells and maybe 30 different types of cells, we are able, therefore, to detect the presence of any sodium channel subtype, any calcium channel subtype, and any potassium channel subtype that's expressed in any one of the 30 different types of cells. And that's, this is a very high content assay. 
And so now we have a lot of peptides uh, that are quite specific for ion channels. And basically what we do is we apply these peptides from cone snail venoms uh, to these types of preparations uh, from the DRG dorsal root ganglion. And what you can see uh, in, shown in the, with the red arrows are two types of peptides that are known to target potassium channels. And when they were discovered, uh, it was thought that one of them, R3J, was specific for KV1.2 channels, and the other one, PL14A, was thought to be specific for KV1.6 channels. So when we apply these to uh, peptides, and their structures are shown here, uh, and as you can see, they're unrelated to each other, but they both block potassium channels, and they come from different snails. But now when we apply them uh, to these dorsal root ganglion cells, what you can see here are shown four classes of cells. Uh, and the first two classes respond to the first peptide, R3J, but in very different ways. Uh, you have a fairly mild response uh, with the first group and a really strong response with the second group. Uh, but neither of those groups respond uh, to the first peptide, PL14A. The third group responds to the uh, PL14A peptide, but not uh, to the R3J peptide. And the last group doesn't respond to either peptide. So in this experiment, 80% of the cells were like the last group. They don't respond to either peptide. But there were cells that responded to one or the other peptide. So we thought, okay, uh, what that means is that there's KV1.2 containing uh, potassium channels in the first two groups of cells, and there's KV1.6 containing potassium channels uh, in the other group of cells. And we could identify what some of these cells were because we can genetically label some of the cells that respond. Uh, and it turns out that some of the response to the uh, peptide that uh, hits the KV1.2 uh, channel, uh, the R3J peptide, are cells that are labeled uh, and they are mechanoreceptor containing cells. And so by combining genetics with this pharmacology, we can begin to localize in which types of cells uh, different, uh, uh, different types of potassium channels are. But we really haven't bitten the bullet. We haven't really identified which heteromeric form of potassium channel is expressed in these different types of cells and what that physiological role is. And so what I'd like to show you is how we approach that. Uh, and so here's an experiment where we use the R3J peptide but at different concentrations. Uh, and what we find is that some cells, group B, respond to very low levels of the R3J peptide, 25 nanomolar, on the other hand, another group of cells in group C don't respond to the peptide at all until you get to a high concentration, one micromolar. And it turns out that it is this last group that probably has the homomeric KV1.2 potassium channel. Because in vitro, when you uh, form this homomeric channel, uh, it has uh, an affinity consistent with its only being activated uh, at concentrations close to one micromolar. So what is uh, going on with the cells that are activated uh, at that very low concentration? And my collaborator, Heinz Terlau, has essentially cross-linked uh, these potassium channels together to try to solve this problem. And what he's found is that these are likely a heteromeric channel with one KV1.1 subunit and one KV1.2 subunit. And it turns out that this peptide, which we thought was specific for KV1.2, is probably really targeted to this heteromeric channel because it has an over 100-fold higher affinity for this heteromeric combination than for this homomeric combination. And in order to prove that that really is what's present in these cells, we use a different pharmacological agent, uh, DTXK from a snake. Uh, and this is uh, specific only for potassium channels that have a KV1.1 subunit. And as you can see, the group B cells respond to the snake toxin. Uh, the group C cells do not, showing, again, that those cells have a homomer of KV1.2, uh, but the 
uh, group B cells have a mixture of KV1.2 and 1.1. So for the first time, we feel we have identified a heteromeric potassium channel that isn't really composed of only a single type of subunit. And now we want to address the question, what is the physiological role of this potassium channel in the neurons where it is found? And in order to do that, we have to identify what the neuron does. So the way we do that is to look at the response of the neuron to particular known pharmacological agents. So as I told you, we're looking at 200 cells at the same time. And out of the 200 cells, less than 10% will respond to a well-understood pharmacological agent, menthol. And of course, if you chew gum, uh, you know what that's like. It makes your mouth feel cold. And the reason is that menthol activates the cold sensor, which is an ion channel called TRIP-M8. And so out of all of the neurons in this ganglion, uh, less than 10% respond to menthol. And those that respond to menthol respond also to cold temperatures. And what's shown in this slide is that there are two types of cold-sensitive neurons. One of them is called a cold thermosensor. And if you make the bath a little bit cold, so in this case, we have a bath that's only 17 degrees, uh, it will respond. Uh, if you make the bath even colder until you get to noxious cold temperatures, 4 degrees, uh, then another set of neurons will also respond. And so uh, a variety of experiments suggests that the cold-sensitive neurons uh, essentially fall into two classes. Those that simply tell your central nervous system that it's cold, uh, and those that tell the central nervous system that it's dangerously cold, and therefore they also signal pain. And so those are called uh, nociceptors. So it turns out that if you look at these two types of cold-sensitive neurons, and you simply give them pulses of menthol, uh, what you find is that the thermosensors are not affected by that conus peptide that will, at high, with high affinity, uh, block the potassium channel that we just described, the heteromeric potassium channel. However, the nociceptor, as you can tell, is in fact affected uh, by that particular peptide and at the same time is also affected by the KV1.1 uh, specific peptide. So one of the neurons that has this heteromeric uh, potassium channel with three KV1.2 subunits and one KV1.1 subunit is a cold nociceptor. So what's it doing there? What's the physiological function of this potassium channel? And it appears that what this potassium channel is doing is it's setting the threshold at which the cell fires, okay? And so if you look at a thermosensor, it begins to respond even with slightly cold temperatures, 17 degrees. And presumably what's sensing that is the TRIP-MA channel, which is the cold sensor. However, the nociceptor also has the same cold sensor. So why doesn't it respond to this uh, mildly cold temperature? And the reason seems to be that this potassium channel shown in deep blue here that that potassium channel is present in the nociceptor. And so what happens is that when the uh, cold sensor opens up, uh, if uh, it opens up, it depolarizes the membrane and it activates calcium channels. And as a result, you get the thermosensors responding. However, the same thermosensor uh, opens up in response to cold, but now if you also have that potassium channel that I just described, uh, then that potassium channel is also activated when the cold thermosensor is activated because if you depolarize the membrane, that activates the potassium channel. And the potassium channel reverses the electrical effects of the cold thermosensor of the TRIP-MA channel. And so as a result, the cell doesn't fire. And 
So now we know the function of that specific potassium channel. It modulates the temperature, the threshold at which a particular cell is going to fire. And when you have a lot of this potassium channel expressed, that means now you require very cold temperatures because now you have to activate uh, the channel that senses cold, the TRIP-MA channel, sufficiently to overcome that potassium channel. But if you don't have a lot of that potassium channel, then that cell will begin to fire at a more elevated temperature. So we understand now the physiological function of one type of potassium channel in one type of cell. And immediately, there are biomedical implications. Because when patients have cancer uh, and they take certain types of chemotherapeutic agents, uh, especially in chemotherapies that have platinum, very often they stop their chemotherapy because suddenly they feel painful even in mildly cold uh, conditions. And so what that suggests is that maybe this potassium channel uh, is not working the way it should. And so instead of only sensing very cold temperatures uh, before you feel pain, uh, now these cold nociceptors will begin to respond to higher temperatures. And so this is a biomedically important problem. So you can see uh, this is only the first type of heteromeric channel in a single type of cell. Uh, the vast complexity of potassium channels, every neuron has them. Uh, this is a field for the future that's wide, wide open. Uh, and we need a huge number of pharmacological agents to get them. So where are we going to get all of those new pharmacological agents? And what I'd like to do is show you uh, a new possibility. So it turns out that cone snails are not the only venomous mollusks in the ocean, that there are a lot of others. Uh, and they fall into two groups in addition to the cone snails. And they're called turids and auger snails. And what's really remarkable is that from the point of view of biodiversity, cone snails are a very small group compared to the others because turids have 12,000 species. And cone snails have, at the most, 700 species that are known. So if there are that many species of turids, why don't people study turids? Well, the reason is they're very hard to get. They live in deep water, a lot of them, and they're very small. So Turids have been un inaccessible, but there has been a breakthrough, and not all breakthroughs have to be high tech. So I'm going to show you uh, what this breakthrough looks like. This is a fisherman in the Philippines. Uh, he's going to dive and look for the end of a rope that he tied uh, to a rock five months earlier. And this rope uh, will be brought up to the boat. Uh, and at the end of the other end of the rope are a bunch of nets, old fishing nets, uh, that these fishermen tied together. Uh, and it's a very, very fine mesh. They're discarded fishing nets. And they call this lumen lumen, which in the local dialect means uh, together or acting together. Uh, and so these nets uh, have been. Uh, have become an ecosystem uh, after five months. Uh, larvae that are floating in the water begin to settle in the nets. And so as the fishermen raise these nets, uh, what they're going to be able to do is harvest the entire ecosystem uh, that has established itself in these nets. So this is a commercial enterprise. Why are the fishermen doing this? The fishermen are doing this because in Japan, uh, Parents love to give their kids microscopes. And they always want them to look at natural history objects. So they're always coming down to the to Philippine villages asking for teeny little shells, which are very hard to find. Uh, so some clever fisherman uh, figured out that if he just take, took his old fishing nets and dropped them in very deep water, left them there for several months, uh, that then, if he raised the nets, uh, all these little snails would settle in the nets, and now, uh, all, all these guys have to do is go to the shore, shake the nets out, and all of these uh, teeny little snails uh, will come out of the nets, and all they have to do is dry them in the sun. Uh, and so that's the commercial activity. And when we heard about this, 
we said, we've got to find out what's in those nets, uh, because maybe they're turids, because we knew that turids uh, were, in fact, uh, found in, in fairly deep water and are usually very, very small. Uh, and so sure enough, uh, after we found uh, that the fishermen were doing this, we decided to ask what is in this particular net, this net that we filmed. And so what we've done is we've analyzed uh, the contents of a single lumen lumen net. And so here are the fishermen bringing it in and their commercial catch looks like this, lots of small shells. Uh, that's a one centimeter scale bar. So these are adult micro mollusks uh, that are mature when they're three to six millimeters in length. Uh, and here it turns out there were a thousand uh, different uh, organisms, uh, 300 different species, and by far the biggest group are the snails, 155 species of snails. Uh, and when we look at those, 30 of those are turids in a single net. 30 species in one net. So what that means is now we can take those 30 species we can analyze their venom ducts, we can figure out uh, what's being expressed, and the conclusion from this analysis is that whether you're conus geographus, a snail this big, or whether you're a little turid, uh, which uh, here's the commercial uh, product that the Japanese sell in for uh, uh, really very expensive prices in downtown hobby shops in Tokyo, but there are turids in here that are tiny, two millimeters in length, that your venom is equally complicated, uh, equally complex. And so although these are very small animals with modern biological techniques, we can access uh, what they're expressing uh, and we can begin to synthesize these peptides. And so the first peptide that we synthesized came from the snail shown in the arrow, uh, which uh, is a very small turid. And here's the sequence. And what we found out is it's a potassium channel inhibitor. And what it does is it causes potassium channels that are a subset of those affected by a conus peptide, PL14A, uh, to be affected. And so with this very novel peptide from this very small turret, we're now able to begin to tease apart the different forms of potassium channels that presumably contain a KV1.6 subunit. So for us, this is a real breakthrough, but uh, what I'd really like to address is that there are many problems in neuroscience. Many of them cannot be solved by genetics alone. We're going to need tools uh, to be able to address these. And now we not only have 700 species of cone snails, we have 12,000 species of other venomous mollusks as a pharmacopoeia. Uh, and a source of these future tools. And uh, I think that's part of the future of what uh, venomous peptides are going to do. So I would like to acknowledge uh, all the people who uh, contributed, uh, in particular, the work on tourist venoms uh, with uh, my colleagues in the Philippines and Constellation Pharmacology uh, that was recently developed uh, by Russ Tyker and uh, graduate students who worked with him. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.